What would you do if one day you woke up beside a stranger who wouldn't stop kissing you? And what would you do if she were the face of a dead girl? This is the story of Ray, a guy who finds himself in exactly that strange circumstance. We meet Ray in the future. While exploring an abandoned building, he hears footsteps in the corridor. In the panicked moments before the stranger reaches the door, he puts together the pieces of some monstrous mystery, but it's too late. From the doorway emerges the vague figure of a woman. Ray asks her to take it easy on him, though somehow, I don't think this creature is the merciful type. The strange figure reveals a pair of fangs, and in a horrific frenzy, tears out his eyeball, several fingers, and then his hand. After that gruesome scene, we go back in time, to one year before the incident. Ray woke up on a regular morning to find his AC unit jammed in the worst way possible. There's a spider living inside of it. After starting his morning routine, Ray discovers a giant cobweb beside his bed that only appeared in the last two hours. Already sick of his arachnid roommate, he runs to the store to buy some spider repellent, and after laying it out, he runs to college for the day. But it doesn't do him any good. When Ray returns, he finds even more cobwebs than before. The battle goes on for quite some time. Even though he never catches the spider, he finds evidence of it all around his apartment, until it starts to drive him crazy. Over the next few days, the spider starts acting more careful, and doesn't leave any more webs. So, he stops obsessing about it, and focuses on the important things in his life, like his girlfriend, Kyoko. He's just leaving for their date when he runs into a new patch of spider webs, but since he's rushing out the door, he doesn't stop to check the area. Something tells me that's gonna come back to bite him later on. Ray takes Kyoko to the aquarium for their date, where she has a great time. Although, she has noticed that he's not been acting his usual self lately, and makes a point of trying to cheer him up. After a full day with his adorable girlfriend, Ray is over the moon. He's almost totally forgotten about the spider, until he returns home to find a giant web in his face. His mood is immediately ruined when he discovers just how busy his roommate has been while he was away. It's never been this bad before. There are cobwebs in every corner, sprawled across the entire apartment. Ray suspects that the spider only went this far because it was trying to express its anger, but who knows what it could be mad about. Before going to bed that night, Ray finds several strands of dark hair caught up in some of the webs. After cleaning the apartment and properly closing his window, he decides to try and get some sleep, convincing himself he must have been mistaken. That is, until a horrific shadowy figure crawls out from under his bed and finally reveals herself. When she suddenly takes the shape of a young high school girl, Ray is totally stunned. He doesn't even know how to react. Now that the spider he's been living with for so long is leaning over him on the bed, looking kinda cute. Before he even knows what's happening, she's kissing his neck. From there, things move very quickly. The girl reveals a pair of fangs and bites into his neck. But she's not just sucking his blood. Ray can feel something entering too. Something that stops him from resisting her. When she moves to his lips, he discovers that his body no longer obeys his commands. His hands move by themselves and embrace her, even though his head is thinking of poor Kyoko. Once he gets some control back, Ray rushes for the door, hoping to escape. But she catches him, pointing her finger to send spiderwebs shooting across the room and trapping his legs. Whatever power she has over him must be seriously strong, because she's able to force him back to the bed, where her sweet and innocent face draws him back in. Before he knows it, Ray is back in her arms, unable to resist this beautiful but terrifying woman. Though, if there's one thing he knows for sure, it's that this girl is no high school teen. She's a monster. And actually, he's right. As it turns out, the girl he's kissing is Maiba Yuko, a 17-year-old whose body was just discovered a few days ago, with all her organs removed. Yikes. Next, we find ourselves in a police station, following Officer Daisuke Ono, who is investigating the murder of Maibara Yuko. The autopsy results have totally stumped the forensic scientists. When they first found the body, it was so mauled that they couldn't even identify it. The scientists suggest that the state of the body is more like the remains of an animal's meal than a human murder, even though there was nothing on the scene to suggest the presence of an animal. Even an expert like Dr. Matsui thinks it looks more like the work of a ghost or a monster. Obviously, that's not especially helpful to Officer Daisuke, so he takes the autopsy report and leaves Matsui to himself. While pondering the case, the scientist spots a spider on the ceiling, which is a little odd because he's seen a lot of them today. After a long and exhausting shift, he decides to head home, but he doesn't get one foot out the door before an army of spiders appears from the shadows, accompanied by a familiar shadowy specter behind him. Well, something tells me we won't be seeing that guy again. Back at Ray's place, he's still being feasted on by whatever demon has taken over Yuko's body. He's not really resisting anymore, and honestly, who could blame him? For the past few days, they've been in a strange cycle of kissing and bloodsucking, a cycle he tries to break by attempting to talk to her. The Yuko monster seems to have difficulty understanding his speech, and prefers to snuggle and chow down on his neck rather than attempting communication. Switching tactics, Ray turns on the news. They're still covering the murder of the dead girl, allowing him to confirm that the one sitting on his lap really does have the same exact face. They even wear the same uniform. 
Ray can't comprehend how the two could coexist, but even more disturbing is that every time he loses control, he sees an illusion of a giant spider behind the girl parading as Yuko. He starts to wonder if they're both pawns, the dead girl and him, being controlled by a greater force they cannot see. Either way, things don't really look good for Ray. He's tried to escape several times, but each time he lost control of his body. When he tried to lock her out, she just reappeared a moment later on his bed. At one point, he even called the police, and of course, when they showed up, she was nowhere to be found. So after a while, he just sort of gave in. After all, even normal guys would have trouble resisting a girl who only ever wants to make out. But their lover's paradise is suddenly shattered when he gets a call from Kyoko. He manages to sneak out to answer it, and immediately gets an earful from his girlfriend. His absence at college has been noticed. He hasn't been responding to her messages. Of course Kyoko is worried. Ray apologizes and fumbles for an excuse, complaining that he wasn't feeling well. But it totally backfires. Kyoko is already on the way to his apartment and plans to stay with him so that she can look after him. Uh-oh. How's this girlfriend going to react to a very handsy high schooler who lives on his bed? She arrives at his door, announcing that she's going to spend the night and even make him a lunch for tomorrow. Ray tries to stop her from coming in, but Kyoko totally misunderstands. For some reason, she thinks that because he's been ill, he must have been looking at dirty stuff and is now trying to hide it. Even weirder, she wants to see what he was looking at so that she can get to know his sexual preferences. Well, I suppose that's considerate? She bursts into his room, but finds no trace of Yuko. For once, it seems like she's decided to do Ray a favor and stay hidden for a while. Later, she catches Ray reading an article about the recent serial killings. Even Kyoko has been worried since it's pretty big news, but apparently it's still not as exciting as a sleepover with her boyfriend. Ray assumes he's going to be taking the floor, but Kyoko has other plans, so the two of them climb into bed together for a snuggle. It might be kinda cute, but Ray can't really enjoy it because of the psychopathic shape-shifting spider lurking somewhere in his apartment. While they're cuddled up together, Kyoko apologizes for forcing him into bed with her. Ray says it's fine, but admits that he's been feeling a little depressed lately. And for some reason, that makes Kyoko offer to sleep with him. I'm not sure sex is exactly psychologist approved, but this girl seems really keen. After a month of dating, it seems like she's getting a little desperate. She places his hand on her chest and talks sweetly while he just sort of stares at her. Because what Kyoko doesn't realize is that the demon in Yuko's body has reappeared right behind them, and she's reaching for his girlfriend. Rei snatches her out of reach and begs Yuko to leave them alone. Of course, Kyoko thinks he's talking to her and gets up to leave. He tries to explain the misunderstanding, but it's kind of hard to explain that there's a spider woman haunting your home if you can't actually see her. Embarrassed, Kyoko apologizes for trying to rush things. Before she leaves, she confesses her love and only stops when Rei admits he loves her too. She runs back to kiss him, suddenly all happy again and waves goodbye, promising to see him at college. As soon as the door closes, Yuko appears again, pushing him against a wall and forcing him to look deep into her eyes while she kisses him. Meanwhile, poor Kyoko is walking home with no idea that her boyfriend is making out with a dead girl. She's busy pondering her next move with Rei when she notices a spider web on her sleeve and brushes it off without thinking twice. The next morning, Ray has a dream about his past, a flashback about the first time he met Akutsu Junya in high school. But before he can remember much, he wakes up with a face full of breasts, which is apparently just the way Yuko likes to wake him up these days. Remembering what happened with Kyoko last night, he pushes her away and checks his phone, wondering how he can make things up to his girlfriend. That makes his attention-seeking arachnid pretty mad, so she shoves him back onto the bed and tackles him, trying to climb back on top of him. He just about manages to wriggle free, and runs to the fridge to discover there's not much food left. Obviously, any human needs food, but especially a guy who's having his blood sucked every day. So Ray gets down on his knees and begs Yuko to let him go grocery shopping, promising not to hide or run away. As usual, Yuko just sort of stares at him blankly, so he gets a map to show her all the spots he'll be visiting. Eventually, he escapes, inviting her along. Since she never shows herself to anyone other than him, it's easier just to take her with him instead of begging for her permission. But when he arrives in the grocery store, all thoughts of Yuko leave his head. While doing his shopping, he bumps into his old high school buddy Janya, the same guy he dreamt about last night. Talk about a coincidence. Junya invites him back to his place for a drink and some snacks. Since they also go to college together, he's been just as worried about Rei as Kyoko, and asks if he's been sick. Rei is distracted, worrying about Yuko showing up at any moment, but that doesn't put Junya off one bit. Instead, he starts asking about Kyoko and how their date at the aquarium went. Even though he doesn't say much, it's pretty clear that Rei is down about how things have turned out between them, so he shoves a beard down his throat and gives him some love advice. After talking half the night away, Junya gets up to buy more cigarettes and invites Rei to read any of his mags while he's gone. I think I'm starting to like this guy. Ray wanders to the balcony, where he finds a man next door playing the guitar. Watching over the city, Ray takes comfort in the idea that Yuko might leave him alone so long as he's always around other people. It would be a nice theory, if it were true. 
But even when Yuko isn't there, her presence still lingers. While Rei is enjoying the peaceful evening, he spots a giant hairy spider on the balcony. Now that can't be a coincidence. Jenya returns home a moment later with food and drink, but Rei can only focus on the spider web stuck to his shoulder. Rei totally freaks out, and the next thing he knows, the apartment is gone. Instead, he's surrounded by decimated corpses, with their insides torn out. Before he can get as much as his thoughts together, a giant webbed cocoon sneaks up on him. A female figure appears, wrapping him tight in her embrace as he's swallowed by the webbing. Huey wakes up screaming, though apparently that's still not enough to rouse good old Junya. And what do you know? There she is. Now that he's the only conscious person in the room, Yuka has decided to make her appearance, rushing straight back into his arms and feasting on his blood while his best friend is literally only meters away. The moment Sleepyhead starts to wake up, she disappears in a flash, leaping off the balcony. Chunya thinks he's drunk and asks if he's okay as Ray finally starts to lose it, laughing and gasping like a madman. He's totally freaking out, having some kind of panic attack while hearing the voices of the monster in his head. It seems like she's finally learning how to speak, and that speech can reach him even when he's far away, which is super freaky. Chunya is obviously pretty concerned, so he offers him some water, but Ray grabs his coat and runs straight for the door, pretending that something urgent calls him back at home immediately. Before he leaves, he asks Jenya to forgive him, though he doesn't say what for. He runs into the night, determined to stay away from the people he cares about now that he knows Yuko will follow him no matter what. And just to emphasize the danger his loved ones are in, there's a body hanging up in the playground right where he stopped to catch his breath. It's horrifically mutilated, but Ray can just about identify the face of the guitar player from earlier that evening, Jenya's neighbor. In another flashback, we see Ray with his uncle, none other than Officer Daisuke Ono from the police station. He's brought his nephew a meal, since he's worried about his health, though it looks like Daisuke is the one who needed a little pick-me-up. The serial killings have really been getting to him, since they have almost no leads and the departments are starting to blame him for their lack of progress. For obvious reasons, Ray is curious about the most recent murder, the one he stumbled upon. His uncle seems hesitant to talk at first, but eventually, he lists the details of all the cases, laying out cigarettes to represent each of the six victims so far. The first was a member of a construction company, and seemed to have been killed by an industrial machine, which is out of line with the others. The second was Yuko, who was found with all her organs removed in a very messy state. The others were all in similarly horrifying states, with limbs cut off and rearranged, bits and pieces scattered across the crime scenes. Then there's the sixth victim, the one Ray found, who was mostly in one piece except for his intestines. Yuck. It's not clear if these murders were all committed by the same person, and there's no rhyme or reason when it comes to motive. But Daisuke has found a link between the second and subsequent victims. All the organs were removed. Other than that, he's stumped. Just as they're digging into their food, Daisuke gets a phone call notifying him of a seventh victim. When Ray gets home, he finds Yuko waiting for him. She's happy to see him, but Ray can't help but wonder what she's been up to while he was gone. Every time he visits someone, she vanishes, and every time she vanishes, another body is found. It doesn't take a genius to realize she's probably got something to do with the murders. Until he can prove it, however, Ray is powerless, especially since she keeps seeing the illusion of that giant spider every time they kiss. Talk about killing the mood. Although, it doesn't put him off all that much. Ray is still a guy after all, and after lacking like lovers for so long, he started to develop a natural chemical reaction to Yuko. He's stuck in a kind of torment, between his body and his head, fighting for control while this monster continues to drain him of blood. Meanwhile, Jenya and Kyoko are meeting at an art studio to talk about Ray, since they're both pretty concerned about him. Jenya reveals to Kyoko what he and her boyfriend found that night, and the way he was acting just before they found the corpse. Kyoko feels a little weird as well, and the two of them share stories about his behavior changing suddenly while hanging out with them. He gets scared very quickly these days, and can even map out the time frame of these changing behaviors. They both agree to keep an eye on him, and try to visit as often as they can. Then, Jenya spots some creepy paintings in the corner of the studio. Kyoko explains that one of the students, Fujitong, often paints corpses in weird poses, but it's not just the terrifying content that disturbs Jenya, because between them all is a perfect recreation of the body he found on the playground. Well, it looks like they might finally have a lead on the killer at last. This time, we start with another flashback to Ray's past, meeting his mysterious older brother for the first time. In the memory, the boys were on a fishing trip when a man with a knife suddenly appeared. He was going for Ray, but his older brother protected him and got stabbed in his place. Suddenly, the memory turns dark, as his brother's corpse crawls towards him asking why he's the one who survived. Ray wakes suddenly, relieved to find it was a dream, but still pretty traumatized, as you would be if you had to relive the memory of your brother's death. Seeing him shaken, the monster living in the body of Yuko, the high schooler, reaches out to comfort him. Ray shakes her off, expecting her to leap on him and start sucking his blood like she always does. But this time is different. Yuko just touches him gently, trying to force him to smile. In a moment of vulnerability, he opens up to her about his brother. Clearly, Ray still feels a lot of guilt about being the one to survive, and had a very hard time after his death. The only one who looked out for him was his uncle Daisuke. 
Daisuke was the reason why he moved to Tokyo, where he finally got a friend and a girlfriend. But they might as well be miles away while he's with Yuko, who controls him and forces him to stay by her side. After fixing himself some breakfast, Ray finds Yuko controlling a small army of spiders before sending them scuttling into his air conditioning unit. Really, she is just the worst roommate ever. Ever since his uncle's visit, Ray has been recording her movements at night so that he can check if her absences line up with any future murders. It is suspicious that Ray's visits to friends and family have correlated with the discovery of new bodies after all. But in the five days since he started surveillance, he's caught absolutely nothing. Unless you count shots of Yuko trying to turn him on all night. He starts to wonder what this monster eats. Obviously, she's feeding on his blood, but most of the victims have been found with their internal organs removed. Maybe that's how she gets her real sustenance? While he's deep in thought, the footage changes. Yuko disappeared at some point overnight and came back with something suspicious to eat. Could his theory be correct? Ray immediately turns the news back on, waiting for any more signs of a new victim. If one appears in the next couple of days, his suspicions will be confirmed. But if they are, he can't exactly turn her into the police. The only thing he could do is take care of her himself. Testing his willpower, Ray climbs on top of her with his hands around her throat, imagining what it would be like to have to kill her. He can't do it. And luckily for him, Yuko doesn't seem to realize what he was attempting. Suddenly, the headlines are announced from the TV, reporting the death of one Akutsu Junya. Just like the other bodies, certain organs had been removed from his corpse. It looks like Ray finally has the evidence he needed, and if there's anything that would give him the motivation to murder, it's the death of his best friend. Things might be about to get real dark, real fast. After the shock of the news, Ray has another flashback to one lunch he spent with Janya. He remembers asking his friend why he was involved with someone so gloomy and cowardly as him, to which Janya answered him with a slap on the head. At the time, he said there was no particular reason he chose to hang out with him, and that friendship should never be based on a person's good or bad qualities. The memory only makes him angrier. Back in the present, Ray asks Yuko if she killed him. He thinks she must have attacked Janya because of their friendship, and can't bear the thought that he might be responsible for another death, just like his brother's. He throws her to the floor, but Yuko still doesn't understand his anger. In fact, she probably can't understand anything he's saying. Furious, Ray raises his fist to punch her, but can't bring himself to land the blow. After all, she's not human. Who knows if it would even hurt her? Once again, Yuko misinterprets the situation and wraps her arms around him, so Ray yells at her and slaps her before finally sinking a punch into her stomach. Yuko curls up on the bed, clutching at her side. Well, looks like we've answered the question of whether she feels pain or not. But even after he attacked her, she still reaches for him, trying to hold his hand. This time, Ray doesn't hold back. He throws punch after punch, disturbed by the way she continues to reach out for him each time with her big, innocent eyes. He reminds himself that she's a monster, that she killed his best friend, but the truth is that it pains him to hurt her. After countless blows, Yuko lies bruised and bloody on the bed beneath him. He's reaching for her neck, ready to finish her off for good, when a single tear slides down her cheek. Ray hesitates. Is she really a monster if she can cry? He starts yelling, but instead of killing her, he remembers Junya, and the memory makes him cry. In his moment of weakness, Yuko leans up and kisses him, deeply and passionately. Then she takes his hands and smiles, as if he didn't just try and end her life. But things only get weirder when she suddenly transforms before him, little more than a whirl of air that disappears, leaving nothing but her bloodstains on his bed. The next morning, he wakes up, expecting to find her clamoring all over like usual. But Yuko is gone, and for the first time in weeks, he's able to do anything he wants. Instead of being relieved, Ray is miserable. His best friend is still dead, and now he's feeling conflicted about the girl he tried to kill. She used her powers to keep him under her control so many times, but never at the end, not even to stop him beating her. Isn't that kind of strange? While having breakfast, he gets a phone call from Kyoko, who asks if they can meet up today. She seems like she's in a pretty bad way, so Ray gets dressed and rushes straight out the door. But he freezes when she admits something dark that she might be the one who really killed Junya. Rei next appears at the door of Fuji Tong, the artist Junya was going after, whose real name is Shuchiro Toto. But riding to a few hours ago, we find out Rei ran straight over to Kyoko, who told him everything about the strange guy in her art class who draws dead bodies and how Junya came to the art building and found his paintings. He asked Kyoko for the artist's details, and then one day he texted her, saying he was going over to Shuchiro Toto's house and that if he didn't make it back, she should call the police. She called them straight away, but no one has heard from Shuchiro Toto since that day. The police didn't find anything to link him to the previous cases, and there was no evidence to suggest he killed Junya, but poor Kyoko still feels responsible for sending their friend to his death. After hearing the story, Ray asks to see the paintings. His girlfriend refuses at first, and then tells him the paintings were all removed after Junya's death. Coincidence? I think not. Ray asks her to describe them instead, and Kyoko manages to list off the details of every one of the murder victims, even down to what positions the bodies were left in. 
Suddenly, putting the strings together, Ray tells Kyoko he has to visit the artist, but asks her to do something important for him first. Back to the present, Ray is standing inside the home of Shuchiro Toto, after claiming to have an interest in his work. The artist mentions Junya, claiming another boy arrived saying the same thing not long ago, and makes some very strange comments about his body. They step inside his private studio, a room full of gruesome depictions of death, decapitations, and all kinds of messed up sculptures. They sit down for a cup of tea, where Shuchiro launches into some creepy philosophical explanation of life and death. He's been talking about art non-stop, avoiding all the questions Ray tried to ask that might lead him to the truth. He takes a sip from the very fancy tea he prepared, and decides to ask his questions outright. Shuchiro claims he threw the paintings from the art school away, since he wasn't satisfied with them. Then, Ray asks him to explain the link between those paintings and the serial murder case. He admits the real reason he came was to investigate the murders, especially the case of Janya, who ended up dead after talking to the artist. He lies that he was the person to find the fifth body, and even reveals that he knows someone on the inside who gave him details about all the crime scenes. Chichiro tries to claim that his paintings probably resemble the cases because they are about pain and death. For each of the paintings, he has an explanation, and tries to pass them off as completely unrelated to the murders. But what he doesn't realize is that Ray has already caught him. Even though he didn't give any details about the crime scenes, somehow the artist knew which painting he was talking about in every case. Now, that really is too suspicious to be a coincidence. Ray finally snaps, yelling at him to stop pretending and demanding to know what he did with Junya. Instead of defending himself, or maybe telling him to get out of his house, like a normal person, Shuchiro warns Ray to lower his voice, in case he accidentally summons a monster. Suddenly, he gets up to unveil a new painting, one he just completed. And yep, you guessed it. It's of Junya without his skin and hung by his neck. It's a pretty gruesome sight, and poor Ray is so shocked that for a minute he can hardly speak. But finally, he has proof. Shuchiro confesses to his role in the murders, with the help of someone he calls the Black Clothed Goddess. Oh, and the next sacrifice is going to be Ray, who has suddenly lost control of his body. Come on, man, that's rule number one. You knew better than to drink that tea. With Rei passed out on the floor beneath him, Shuchiro goes into full villain mode and reveals how he killed Junya. He was weirdly obsessed with his physique, so he gagged and tied him up after drugging him with the milk, just the same way he got Rei. Before becoming an artist, he wanted to be a doctor. That would explain how he was able to remove all the organs from his victims and take off Junya's skin. Shuchiro seems to enjoy telling the horrific tale of his murders. He's been this way since childhood, enjoying the pain of others and going out of his way to cause suffering first to animals, and then humans. Once his parents found out about his behavior, they abused him to teach him a lesson, which, if anything, only worsened his violent streak. But while Shuchira had been monologuing, he unknowingly gave Ray's body time to shake off the anesthetics. The artist is shocked to see him standing, since there's no way a normal person could have recovered from the drugs that fast. Something tells me Yuko might have had a hand in that. Suddenly, Ray is the one with the power, and it's Shuchiro who is nervous. He called himself a monster to justify his horrible crimes, but Ray says he's nothing more than a murderer, trapped in his own delusions. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. At which point, Ray raises his phone to reveal that he's been on the line with Kyoko this whole time. She showed the police, who heard everything, including his confession to the murders and his plan to take Ray next. Suddenly, he starts screaming for help, trying to attract the attention of the police before Shuchiro can do anything drastic. The police arrive a moment later, warning them not to move and bursting in to find the artist on his knees in front of Ray. They put him in handcuffs and force him out the door while Shuchiro mutters about his goddess and her black clothes. He mentions something about giving her offerings, even though she never came to his aid. Why do I get the sense that's not the last we've heard of her? Three days later, Ray is back with Kyoko, who is furious with him for putting himself in such danger. After the police arrived, Shuchiro Toto was locked away in prison, and Ray was given a good beating by his uncle for almost getting himself killed. He didn't meet up with Kyoko until the day after, so she still hasn't quite forgiven him for leaving her hanging, especially after she was such a great help in capturing the artist. Now, Ray has avenged his best friend's death, but he can't stop thinking about Shuchiro's last words mentioning that strange goddess. He gets snapped out of his thoughts by Kyoko offering to make him some lunch. She even teases him, offering to cook wearing nothing but an apron. It seems like things are almost back to normal. They share a lovely meal together, even though Ray couldn't taste a thing. He hasn't been able to ever since Yuko started showing up in his apartment. After lunch, Kyoko turns on the news, informing them that Shuchiro Toto was found dead in custody after confessing to the murder of every case of which he was accused. The police are investigating the suicide, but the news leaves Kyoko and Rei confused. The atmosphere of their afternoon is ruined. Neither of them are happy to hear that Shuchiro escaped justice, but at least now he won't hurt anyone ever again. Junya's funeral is being held that weekend, and while Rei wants to attend, 
pretend, Kyoko says she won't. She still feels responsible for sending him to the man who killed him, but Ray assures her she didn't have anything to do with her case. It wasn't her fault that he died. And while that might be true, Kyoko confesses that she was very much involved with Junya's death, since she was the one who took his organs out. Ray is stunned. He's still trying to process what she's just admitted, when his girlfriend pulls out a taser and shocks him to his knees. Hardly conscious on the ground, Kyoko laughs at him and licks her lips, preparing to turn him into a whole new kind of artwork. Whoa, talk about a twist. When Ray wakes up, he's tied to a chair, sat in front of Kyoko. She's all dressed up and happy to see that he's come to his senses. It looks like they're in some kind of studio, but they haven't left her apartment, so she must have hit him over the head and tied him up to drag him there. Ray desperately hopes that he's dreaming, but Kyoko promises him this is all reality and warmly welcomes him to her private studio. Now that she's all dressed up, Ray finally realizes the truth. The black-clothed goddess was his own girlfriend all along. Kyoko confesses to giving Shuchiro all his instructions and providing her with one vital piece that she needed for her art. She steps aside to reveal a giant painting the size of the room and calls it her life's work. It's a painting of a lake, but it's all in red and purple. Three guesses what she used to paint it with. Just like Shuchiro, she has a very fancy philosophy behind her painting and seems to think she's captured the arc of human life within her work. Just like the boat drifting on the lake, all people are just trying to find a purpose as they move through the world. But that's not all the painting represents. She moves to a bloody set of draws and pulls out what looks like an intestine, smiling like a maniac and telling Ray it's Junya's. She seems grossly fascinated by it and starts talking about how impressed she was when Shuchiro pulled off their friend's skin. She has just the same maniacal love for pain that the artist did. The two of them are just the same. Obviously, listening to his girlfriend talk about how she skinned and killed his best friend is pretty horrific, so Ray starts to slump in his seat. Thinking he'd stopped listening, Kyoko beats him violently with a stool and strokes the side of his face with Jenya's intestines. Wow, that is messed up. Ray starts to think back to his relationship, wondering if it was all a lie and how he didn't see that his girlfriend was a psychopath. He screams at her, calling her a murderer. But according to Kyoko, Ray was also involved in Junya's death. That's when he has a horrific revelation. Those bloody intestines look an awful lot like the meat she served for lunch. He doesn't believe it at first, but Kyoko smiles and says it's nice that he and Junya are united again, in his stomach. She drops his insides in a blender while explaining the special ingredient to her cooking and her painting are the same. Ray screams as he watches his best friend's organs word up, silently begging for someone, anyone, to save him. And guess who hears his prayers? His old friend Yugo, who is coming closer and closer as they speak. Meanwhile, Kyoko has begun to paint with Junya's insides, forcing her boyfriend to watch. She can point to every part of the painting and tell him which organs she used, enjoying her chance to show off her masterpiece. But Ray's mind has wandered elsewhere. Suddenly, he asks why she killed Junya, realizing that he was the only victim who had any relation to Kyoko. It doesn't make sense to kill someone who could lead the police to her, but Kyoko is way past reason and logic. As she leans close, hopping up onto his lap, she tells Ray the timing was perfect, that she just had a new and very exciting idea. Now that Yuko is on the way, there's no telling what will happen first. Will Ray be his girlfriend's final victim, or will we finally uncover the mystery of the monster in a teenage body? We start off with a look at Kyoko's childhood, where she was always praised as a well-mannered, hard-working girl with potential. But even though she hated the idea of being ordinary, she continued to live the perfect life, never able to escape the role she was cast. That is, until she met Ray. Immediately attracted to the sorrow in his eyes, she introduced herself, getting closer and closer to him until they started going out. Then, he started smiling, acting happy, and became someone Kyoko was no longer interested in. Ray became the boring, normal, good guy. Frustrated with her ordinary life, it seemed like she was destined to meet Shuchiro one moonlit night, stumbling upon him in the middle of his first murder. Because she's an absolute freak, Kyoko was delighted by the mutilated corpse, and the thrill of thinking she might be his next victim. But instead of killing her, Shuchiro became attached to her after she showed an interest in the messed up pieces he referred to as art. He was like putty in her hands. Kyoko used him to help fuel her obsession with the extraordinary and grotesque, and eventually he even killed himself for her. At the start, the victims were random, but then Jenya and Rei found the sixth body and realized who was responsible, which meant they had to go too. Now that everything is out in the open, she wants Rei to be Shuchiro's replacement, her new slave to help her live outside the ordinary life. According to Kyoko, he's perfect for the role, because he's already killed before, when he let his brother die in his stead. As we know by now, that's a very painful wound for Rei. He is so stunned that he doesn't even try to defend himself when Kyoko takes out her scalpel and slices him across the cheek. 
I guess now we know who's going to be the finishing touches for her human painting. She beats him violently, clearly enjoying every hit. She promises not to let him go, and that she'll take good care of him. Finally, Rei snaps and calls her crazy, screaming that he wants Junya back. So Kyoko offers him some of the leftover entrails of his best friend. Gross. Kyoko plans to use Rei's blood for paint at first, before eventually taking his organs for artistic materials. But her boyfriend isn't listening to her psychotic plans. He tells her she's no monster, only a crazy woman pretending to be something that she's not. The real monster is behind her. Guess who finally joined the party? That's right, it's Yuko. Before Kyoko knows what's happening, Yuko throws her against the wall. Rei is surprised that she came to save him after everything he did to hurt her, but Yuko doesn't seem to care about all that. She kisses him and climbs into his lap. When Kyoko sees, she starts screaming, but she can't move under all the spider webs Yuko wrapped her up in. Rei begs her to untie him, but Yuko is still a little distracted with the whole licking his face thing. Eventually, she transforms her arm into a spider leg and cuts him free. Rei wants to phone the police, but clearly Yuko has no idea what a dangerous situation they're in. She uses her powers to drop him to his knees so that she can start kissing him again. If I didn't know better, I'd think she was doing this on purpose to drive Kyoko insane. And if that was the plan, it's definitely working. Kyoko gets so mad that she pulls herself free of the webs and suddenly rushes at Rei, stabbing him with her scalpel. Rei collapses on top of Yuko, who just holds him in her lap as Kyoko swears to kill them both together. While poor Rei is lying there bleeding out, Yuko is useless yet again, by lapping up his blood rather than trying to save their lives. But it's so crazy that it actually stops Kyoko in her tracks. She finally realizes that Yuko is not human, just moments before an army of spiders descends on the studio, headed straight for her. Yuko throws out some web to trap her on the floor while Rei watches her become completely swarmed by the spiders. Well, I guess Kyoko got her way in the end. That is an extraordinary way to die. So now, the threat is gone, but Rei is still very intrigued and bleeding out faster with every second. Soon, he loses consciousness and finds himself sitting in a familiar place. Soon, he finds a cocoon covered in blood, inside of which Yuko is sitting, eating the same thing he saw her bring back to his room once. With her mouth still covered in blood, she kisses Rei, who tastes blood and feels a strange sensation where his stab wound was. While the two of them start going at it again, some random dude interrupts their steamy dream sequence and starts calling for help. Huh, looks like they were just in some random park. When Rei wakes up, he is in a hospital bed. The first person he sees is his uncle Daisuke, who says he only sustained some bruises and minor injuries. There's no sign of the stab wound. Apparently, the homeless guy who found him in Yuko found them in a park not far from Kyoko's apartment. So, it wasn't a dream after all, and Yuko really carried him all the way to safety. Rei tries to tell his uncle about Kyoko, but he already figured it out. They found a hair in Shichiro's apartment that was a perfect match, so she was going to be investigated anyway. Daisuke asks his nephew to go over the events from that evening to help with the case, and reveals that Kyoko had been reported as missing. Who knows whether that means she really did get eaten by spiders, or if she made it out alive. What the police did find is tons and tons of damning evidence in her apartment, so if she ever does pop up, she'll be on every officer's most wanted in the city. Daisuke then asks about Yuko Maibara. As it turns out, her death was completely unrelated to the murders committed by Shuchiro and Kyoko, so her death is still a mystery. And what's even weirder is that when Rei was brought to the hospital, he was covered in his own blood, as if he had been drinking it. His uncle seems to think he's on drugs, either that or that he's gone insane, and honestly, who can blame him? But he leaves, allowing Rei to finally acknowledge Yuko, who has been apparently standing on the balcony the entire time. After a little bit of heavy petting and some more rest, Rei attends Junya's funeral, and returns home to find his apartment covered in spider webs, and Yuko sitting pretty in the middle of it all. She's even strung up some decorations, little pouches of Rei's blood that she used to save his life and likes to eat as a snack from time to time. Looks like she's really settling in with him now, but Rei is glad to have her, especially in his time of need. After falling asleep for a few hours, he wakes up in the middle of the night to discover that Yuko is nowhere to be found. In her place is a giant hair spider, which Rei takes to be a sign that she's finally decided to eat him. But as soon as she gets close, she transforms back into Yuko's body and just starts licking him again. Seriously, what is with this girl? This time, things get pretty steamy, and Rei doesn't seem to mind it so much, especially now that he's no longer being controlled. After they've done their business, he invites her to stay for real. Next, we get a complete change in perspective by taking a look at the life of Yuko Maibara. You know, before she had all her organs removed and became host to a giant spider monster. Yuko was a normal high school girl, with a pretty average life, until she met Rei. Just like Kyoko, she was attracted to his eyes, the way they seemed soulless just like hers. She was too shy to talk to him, so she followed him around, learning what he liked, where he went to school, and where he lived. But then she saw him with Kyoko and gave up her fantasies of becoming his girlfriend. She went home and cried in her room, and when she fell asleep, she dreamed of a giant spider crawling all over her room. It happened again and again, and each time she saw the spider, she couldn't move. 
After weeks of this dream, the scene changed, and she woke up in Ray's air conditioning unit. Totally freaked out, as anyone would be, she ran away, and ended up in a park, surrounded by an army of spiders, who devoured her to use her body to get closer to Ray. So now we know the truth about how Yuka Maibara ended up in Ray's life. But what about his other girl? Did she truly die, or is she still out there, waiting to return? After all the drama and madness of that night in her studio, Kyoko woke up in a kind of dream sequence, watching Yuko claim her boyfriend while she stood there watching. It made her so angry that it brought her back to her body, trying to fight through the pain of the spiders slowly devouring her. Filled with fury, she fought back against the spiders, driven by screams of revenge against Yuko, and some really gross plans about what to do with her organs. She was so insane that even the spiders started running from her as she crushed them with her fists, tearing them from her face until she could move freely again. Seeing the blood-stained window, she decided to go after Yuko, swearing never to forgive the monster and to get back her boyfriend. But before she got to her feet, she was visited by a mysterious figure in a wheelchair, impressed with Kyoko's strength and survival instincts. Oh dear, looks like we're not done with Kyoko just yet. When Kyoko wakes, she's in some dingy basement, hooked up to an IV drip. A creepy old man in a bloodstained lab coat greets her, and refuses to introduce himself. All he'll tell her is that he's a doctor, and his patient brought her to him. Just then, there's a knock at the door, and the woman in the wheelchair appears. She already knows Kyoko's name, and shows her all the news articles with her face and identity splashed across the web. She's been asleep for six days. Her savior wasn't totally sure she'd wake up. Kyoko asks her what she wants, and though the woman dodges the question, it seems she's very interested in the monster in Yuko's body. She wants to know if Kyoko saw her, and when she admits that she did, the woman promises not to hand her over to the police. Like any normal person in this situation, Kyoko is pretty suspicious. Finally, the woman cuts to the chase and asks her for her help in eliminating the monster. Looks like these two have accidentally stumbled upon the perfect team. Kyoko's last thought before she passed out was that she wanted her dead. The only people who know about the monster at this moment are this stranger, Rei, Kyoko, and one other person who remains a mystery as of now. Kyoko really doesn't trust this lady, but now she's one of the most wanted criminals in the country. It's not like she can exactly go back to her old life, and besides, she really does want revenge. The woman seems to know a lot about the spider monster, and seems confident that with Kyoko's help, they can defeat it. So she offers her help, on the condition that the one who gets to kill her is Kyoko, and Rei is hers to do with what she likes. The woman agrees, and so their bond is solidified. We return to Rei at the end of the summer, who has been mourning the loss of his friends and adjusting to living with a very pervy monster who does not know the meaning of the word privacy. She keeps trying to sneak in uninvited and join him while he's taking a bath. While Rei is trying to explain the concept of manners to her, Yuko suddenly starts to strip, dumping her uniform until she's in nothing but her underwear. Rei starts to freak out, and even though it's nothing he hasn't seen before, I mean these guys did seal the deal the other day. Being a non-human monster, she also doesn't seem to know how bras work, so instead of taking it off, she just kind of rips it. Well, that escalated quickly. Ray grabs her and throws her in the bath, knowing that if he locks her out, she'll just keep coming back. Now that she's in the bath, she seems to have calmed down, so Ray takes a moment to wash himself. Of course, looking away for just a moment gives Yuko the chance to sneak up from behind him while she's all soapy. Ray pushes her away again, but honestly, one guy can only have so much self-control. So he gives in, and climbs into the bath beside her. Of course, Yuko lasts all of about two minutes before she starts kissing him again. Come on, Ray, give it up already, buddy. Once they're out of the bath, they face a whole nother situation to contend with. Yuko has only ever worn her school uniform, and Ray doesn't exactly have any girls' clothes lying around. Just as he's wondering what he can give her, Yuko magically conjures another uniform on her body, knitting a whole new set from spider silk. She leaps on him again, but Ray blasts her off with a hairdryer like a puppy, using it to chase her around corners and force some distance between them. After a few days of domestic bliss, Ray returns to college for the first time in weeks, happy to be back in the routine of classes, assignments, and college lunches. But while he sits down to eat, he is suddenly overcome by fear, as though some strange presence is lurking nearby. Just then, he overhears someone at another table asking people about the serial murders. They seem to be a reporter, and from the questions they've asked, they're looking for Ray specifically. But the police kept his information a secret, and his relationship with Kyoko was still pretty new, so fortunately, no one knows Ray was involved. Suddenly, a new face appears in the cafeteria. Bacteria, one so handsome that people assume he's a celebrity. When Ray turns to look, he too is stunned. The guy has blood red eyes and stardust hair. As he comes towards Ray, he gets just the same feeling as when Yuko used to control him. Although the stranger was looking for him, he seems disappointed with Ray and quickly moves on. But one thing is for certain the boy with the white hair is definitely not a human. Something about him made Ray incredibly anxious, and so he decides he must be a monster. 
After their weird interaction in the cafeteria, Ray goes home early, skipping his afternoon classes. The campus is also swarmed with reporters, so he rushed to get out before anyone could try and question him. On the way home, all he can think about is the parting glance he received from the stranger, who promised that they would meet again just before he disappeared. Which is a little strange, since he seemed to decide that Ray wasn't the person he was looking for. Clearly, based on the other students' reactions, that guy wasn't a college student, which only makes it weirder. A sudden appearance on the path interrupts Ray's thoughts when the woman in the wheelchair stops in front of him. She's mumbling to himself and acting super creepy. It almost seemed like she was waiting for him. Ray decides he's overthinking and walks past her, trying to ignore her. But just as he's passed, she turns and calls him by his name, just the way Kyoko used to. She reached out a hand and wheels towards him, but before she can get close, he starts running, like any normal person would if some creepy lady started rolling over, calling their name. Thoroughly freaked out, Ray arrives at his train station, panting, wishing the train would come faster. Once he's on board, he tries to forget everything from the day, all the creepy strangers who have approached him. For once, he's actually comforted by the idea of Yuko waiting for him at home, but before he can get back, he has to go shopping for groceries. As he's pulling out his list, he hears the squeaking of a wheelchair from the train door behind him, and turns around in disbelief. She asks him for a chat, and for some reason, Ray agrees. They head to a coffee shop, even though the lady wanted him to come and visit her room. At least the boy had enough sense to say no to that. He asks who she is, and why she was following him, but she refuses to tell him, pretending to take the name of a wanted criminal, and then screaming that he's a molester when Ray threatens to tell the police. Jeez, this lady is gonna be trouble. A girl comes to bring their order, and although she looks suspiciously familiar, Ray doesn't question it. After pressuring her for more information, the woman gives him a cryptic answer, and says he looks like someone she's been looking for. She apologizes for chasing him so eagerly, and asks if he is in fact the Ray that she's been searching for. Ray tries to suggest that he might just have the same name as someone else, but the woman makes a strange comment about the soul that's attached to his body, whatever that means. Ray cuts her off, asking what she's talking about, but she suddenly withdraws, dropping some change on the table and heading off. She drops another hint about how she would have visited his place straight away if her legs were better. Understandably, Ray gets a little angry, but the stranger never agreed to answer his questions and says they'll meet again soon. Before she leaves, she gives him one piece of ominous advice, that if he wants his life back, he should kill the monster now while he has a chance. It should be easy since they're so close, but he needs to act fast, otherwise he'll regret it. And with that incredibly vague warning, she leaves. It all seems very mysterious. At the moment, it's difficult to tell if Rei is really in danger or if Kyoko and the wheelchair woman really are just notorious villains. After giving some terrifying and incredibly vague advice, the wheelchair lady gives Rei a phone number on the back of a photograph. She says the man in that picture is dangerous. He's a genius who can get inside people's minds and manipulate them. If they ever meet, she tells Ray not to let him in. Of course, it's the guy from earlier, who found Ray at college. Although, we probably didn't need an ominous warning to know he was bad news. On the way home, Ray is disturbed, but once inside his apartment, he forgets all about the two creeps. Yuko is waiting for him by the door, so he gives her a little pat on the head like a puppy. A puppy that immediately starts sucking his blood. I guess that's one way to welcome someone home. By now, he's used to this, but after his conversation with that strange woman, he started to wonder about Yuko's past. What did she do to make someone want her dead? They've just paused their usual makeout session when someone arrives at the door. It's none other than the red-eyed stranger, who introduces himself as Louis Miojo. Ray shows him into his room, which is covered in spiderwebs and sacks of his own blood. Louis isn't as disturbed as you might expect. He seems to know about Ray's relationship with Yuko, who hasn't disappeared like she usually does when he has company around. Neither of the boys trust each other, so for a while, they struggle to have a real conversation. Louis is kind of a weird character. On the one hand, he's very mysterious and seems curious about how involved Ray is with his spider girlfriend. On the other, he's energetic and friendly, although maybe a little too friendly. While explaining how he snuck into the apartment, he gets real up close and personal with Ray, warning him to lock the door next time. Ray doesn't take that very well and threatens to call the police, but Lewis reminds him that Yuko's presence doesn't look so good if law enforcement shows up. After all, she is a high schooler, or at least her body is. So Ray switches gears and asks Lewis what he's doing in his home. His guess is that Lewis knows something about the monster he's been living with, and Lewis confirms Ray's suspicions. He knows almost everything about Yuko's monster. In fact, he only came to visit so that he could confirm her existence with his own two eyes. Ray asks Lewis to share what he knows about this girl. He's seen her do things that no human can imagine. It's time he knew the truth. Lewis seems to approve of the fact that Ray has decided to coexist peacefully with his monster, at least for the time being. But for some reason, he's hesitant to reveal what he knows. What he does admit is that certain factors could turn sweet little Yuko from an affectionate teenager into a man-eating monster. In fact, we've seen her do it. When Ray was in danger, she turned vicious to save him from Kyoko. Clearly, Ray's behavior is one of those factors. 
how he acts will determine how she acts. If he wanted to, he could even manipulate her and bend her to his will. And that's why Lewis is suspicious of them. He can't tell whether Ray is using Yuko for his own agenda, and Ray doesn't really have a reason to convince him otherwise. After all, the woman in the wheelchair said this guy was dangerous. Just as he's thinking about her, the woman comes up in conversation. Besides Lewis, she's the only other person who knows the monster's secrets. Lewis warns Ray never to let that woman meet Yuko. If she does, she'll do everything in her power to eliminate her. He says the woman's name is Shiori Karasawa, and she's Yuko's sworn enemy. Fast forward to two weeks later, and Ray is having his usual breakfast of coffee and toast, staring lovingly into his girlfriend's eyes, when Lewis walks in and kills the mood. He's been living with them ever since his first visit. Lewis wouldn't agree to give him any information until he knew for sure that he could trust him, so he ended up moving in to decide whether Ray is a trustworthy person. Obviously, Ray debated calling the police, and wasn't sure who to listen to, the woman in the wheelchair or Lewis. In the end, it was Yuko who showed him the right move. Actually, she kind of just prodded his cheek, but it reminded Ray that he's been living beside the supernatural for a while now. Why should he be afraid if another kind of monster moves in? So, he agreed to let Lewis stay and get to know him, on the condition that once he makes his mind up, he will tell Ray everything he knows. But after two weeks, he's still none the wiser, and Lewis has, like, properly moved in. He's making comments about Ray's eating habits and using his bedroom as a giant bookshelf, since apparently he needs to read one book a day to keep his mind occupied. And, of course, the other awkward thing about Lewis moving in is that he's sort of a permanent third wheel. Yuko, obviously, has no sense of self-awareness, and is acting just as touchy-feely as usual. Meanwhile, Ray doesn't want their guests to watch them make out, let alone suck his blood. He asks Lewis if Yuko is some kind of vampire, but he just laughs. While her behavior certainly seems like something out of Twilight, Lewis reveals that vampires actually don't exist, unlike Yuko. He tries to guide Ray toward the answer, getting him to think for himself. So far, the only clues he has are that she's unnatural, one that is believed to be non-existent. Before Ray can arrive at an answer, Lewis turns on the TV to watch the news. Irritated, Ray grabs the remote, but quickly gets sucked into a report of a space probe landing on Earth. There were signs of extraterrestrial life, and evidence of organic matter in the samples, suggesting that life really might be possible outside of Earth. Ray's mind starts to spin. His hands start shaking. Finally, getting the hint, he asks Lewis if the monster came from another planet. Lewis doesn't answer. He slams his book shut, gets up, and walks over to the window, suddenly throwing it open and letting a gust of wind inside. Pretty much the most dramatic way he could have possibly have said, yeah, that's pretty much correct. Although, to be more specific, the monster was born on Earth, but is really an extraterrestrial being. Confused? Don't worry, Ray is too. After all, thinking you've been host to a shape-shifting spider girl is a little different from finding out she's actually an alien. Finally, Lewis seems willing to share his knowledge, so they sit down for a cup of coffee. He explains that Yuko's powers seem unhuman because she's not human. She's from a species not native to Earth. A few years ago, a university professor discovered a giant species of spider and took the creature back to his lab. He started researching, only to discover that what he had found wasn't a spider at all. Since it was a totally unknown species, he returned to the discovery site to try and find others. He failed, so he went back to his first specimen. But strange things started to happen. His wife began entering the lab more often, even though she'd never been interested in his research before. What's even weirder is she never did anything. She just stood behind him, totally silent. Kinda like what Yuko's doing right now. Suddenly, in the middle of Lewis telling the story, Yuko bites Ray, deciding now is the perfect time to start feeding again. Lewis points out that Yuko's behavior is very similar to the wife from the story, and then, like the mysterious oddball he is, he gets up to leave. When Ray tries to stop him, he says they're running out of time, and leaves anyway. After that, they go back to their old routine pretty quickly. Ray and Yuko don't leave the apartment, and the daylight slips by without them noticing. Lewis hasn't come back, and when it occurs to Ray that he might not be planning to return, he races for the door, just to find the man of the hour walking in with some groceries. Since Ray can't taste that much these days, he makes pretty boring meals, so Lewis decided to cook for once, since he's getting sick of bland dishes. He kicks Ray out of the kitchen, which gets him thinking about the last time he really tasted anything. His appetite started going a long time ago, but after stumbling on corpses in the playground and having his ex nearly feed him his best friend's intestines, yeah, you can't exactly blame the guy for losing an interest in food. Lewis turns out to be a pretty amazing cook, so amazing that Ray actually tastes something for the first time in months. Damn. Maybe he was just making really bad food this whole time. But while Ray is having the time of his life, Yuko doesn't seem too happy. There's something about the smell of the steak that she really doesn't like. After they've finished, Ray thanks Lewis, and the two boys settle down to finish their story over a cup of tea. But before they can even turn on the kettle, Ray's vision starts to wobble, and he suddenly falls to the ground. Although Lewis seems shocked at first, it was obviously him that drugged the food. For what it's worth, he apologizes to Ray's unconscious body, with the excuse that he's running out of time. 
What exactly is so urgent remains unclear. All we know is that this man's on a mission. The next second, she has a pincer aimed at his neck, but he reassures her that he's only giving them to Ray in case he needs them. She retracts her pincer as he picks up her boyfriend and tells Yugo to come along with them. He apologizes again to Ray as he carries them out the door. As it turns out, Lewis isn't his enemy, but he's not totally on his side either. Over at Camp Crazy, Kyoko and Shiori the wheelchair woman are sticking candles into a brain and calling it a birthday cake, which is incredibly disgusting, but also pretty on brand for those two. Kyoko offers her a slice, but Shiori says they have more important things to do. They've spent all this time preparing to hunt the monster, learning her abilities, and even creating anti-monster weapons. Shiori tells her to be ready in an hour, but Kyoko asks for two, since she hasn't seen Rei in a long time and she wants to get pretty for him. You know, wash off the blood and all that. Shiori agrees to give her a little longer, and then suddenly she stands up for the first time. Looks like she's finally recovered from whatever was keeping her bound to her wheelchair, which can only mean bad news for the others. Meanwhile, Lewis and Ray are speeding down the highway, when Ray wakes up and tries to piece together what happened. According to Lewis, a reliable source informed him that Shiori was on the move again, and he was certain she would be heading for his apartment. So, they had no choice but to leave. Luckily, they bought themselves some time for Lewis to finally finish his tale about the monster. But he's a little on edge to be telling stories. He's desperate to buy them more time, so he's driving like a maniac. While they're zooming ahead, Ray asks what he did with Yuko, and Lewis points to a spider on the dashboard. It turns out that every time she's disappeared, she's actually just transformed into a really teeny tiny spider. That's one of her powers, an instant scaling ability. Back at Ray's flat, the girls enter to find it empty, which is a bit of a shame, since they got all dolled up. They're standing in the doorway when Daisuke walks in. Kyoko suddenly launches at him with a knife, giving him barely enough time to block the hit with his gun. He recognizes her straight away. Shiori tells her to take him alive, so Kyoko keeps slashing at him until she can jam his gun. Daisuke is flustered, especially because she keeps talking about turning him into her next artwork, and once his gun is out of commission, it's only too easy for Shiori's other ally to grab and tase him. Now, things aren't looking so good for Rei. Not only do they have his uncle, but they can use him as bait. In the car, Lewis asks Rei if he had any connection to the real Yuko, the one who was murdered and who looks identical to the monster. Although their schools were close, Rei doesn't remember seeing her around. He also doesn't understand why his connection to the real Yuko is important. Lewis says it's a very big deal. They must have a connection for the monster of taken Yuko's form. Just like in the past, the spider took the form of the professor's wife, which is why she started to act strange. When he noticed the spider had disappeared from the lab, he searched everywhere. Eventually, the professor went into his wife's room and found it covered in her blood. Her body was completely unrecognizable, and everything had been consumed down to her bone marrow and her brain. And in the middle of that horrific scene was a copy of his wife, standing in front of him. As Ray suspected, Lewis reveals this is what happened to the real Yuko. It's another of the monster's abilities, to replicate the genes of another by eating their insides in order to create their appearance. It's pretty gross, but not any more gross than the behavior of real spiders on Earth. Before Lewis can explain anymore, Ray gets a call from his uncle. When he picks up, it's Kyoko who answers. She says his uncle has a nice body for his age, and that she wants to use it for her next artwork. While Ray is frozen in panic, she tells him she's going to make Ray her masterpiece and swears to never let him go. Suddenly, Yuko appears before him in her human body, as if she's worried about him. Then, Lewis takes his phone and puts it on speaker. He tells Kyoko Rei isn't scared with his monster by his side, and asks Kyoko if he can say hi to her accomplice. Shiori answers the phone, and the two of them kind of flirt with each other? It's a bit weird, but then they get down to business. Lewis threatens to call the police on them for abducting a detective, but the girls say they can't guarantee the safety of the hostage if he does. So, there's that plane out the window. Lewis suddenly steps on the brakes, swinging them into a clearing in the middle of nowhere. They finally arrived at the professor's old laboratory. Lewis tells Shiori exactly where they are and tells her to come too. Before the girls hang up, they say goodbye by telling Ray he won't live to see the next sunrise. Anyone would be terrified to hear that message, but luckily he has Lewis, who claims it's his duty to protect him and the monster. They head inside an operating room, where Lewis says the professor began to examine the spider more closely with a team of collaborators. He moves an operating table to reveal a hidden staircase which looks exactly as suspicious as you'd expect. When they arrive at a special door, Lewis pulls out a key, unlocking it to reveal another room full of doors and a statue of an old man. They head inside one, which looks just like a normal room, other than the window on one side. When he peers through, Ray sees a giant bloodstain on a table, as if something was torn apart and there are web sacks hanging from the ceiling, just like the ones Yuko makes. Ray asks what the bloodstain used to be. Was it the monster? But Lewis says it was the professor and his wife's children. Okay, fair warning. Get ready guys, because things are about to get really wild. It turns out, the professor made children with the monster, who took on his wife's body. The kids that were born were used as test subjects, and that room was a purpose-built nursery with 24-hour surveillance. 
How's that for insane? And while Lewis is telling this messed up story, Yuko is playing with some normal spiders she found on the floor. They're like her allies. She can control them, but they can also become weaknesses if she doesn't use them right. It's how Shiori and Lewis found the monster in the first place, by tracking the movements of spiders and following their locations. That, and using spider silk. Shiori was actually the master of the nursery, one of the observers for the spiders. That's why she knows how to deal with the monsters, and why they're in so much danger. The only thing they have on their side is time, since the lab is so far away from the town. Little did they know that one of Shiori's associates has already made her way inside. The big bad villain herself is chilling outside with Kyoko, who is busy covering their car in kerosene so the boys can't get away. Rei hears the explosion from the basement and steps outside to investigate, where he is immediately attacked by Shiori's minion, holding a thick hunting knife. Lewis only just gets there in time, taking the slash to his elbow to protect Rei before he counterstrikes with a punch so hard it knocks him out. But it gets worse. The knife he was using is coated with something, something they were hoping to use against Yuko. Yep, that's right, this monster's greatest weakness is olive oil. Kinda disappointing if you ask me. But that's why Lewis was cooking with it, and also why he fed it to Ray, so that he could see if it would work the same way on him as it would on a real monster. Lewis is just suggesting they go find cover when a gun fires from somewhere, narrowly missing Ray's head. But it's not Shiori, it's not even Kyoko. The man who fired the gun is none other than Daisuke, Ray's own uncle. How's that for a plot twist? If they weren't in trouble before, they really are now. Now, he knows the truth. Daisuke says Ray is just as guilty as the monster, because he's been harboring her. He's just about to fire again, when something lashes out and throws him against the wall. It's Lewis, who managed to conjure webs and keep Daisuke contained with his spider hand. Plot twist, he's a monster too. It doesn't take long for Daisuke to free himself, so Lewis hands Ray the bag filled with his blood sacks. He orders him to take Yuko and get out. Lewis explains that Shiori has taken control of his uncle's mind. He's far too dangerous right now, as Daisuke proves by launching at Lewis with one hand and aiming at the kids with another. Lewis fires another round of webbing at the gun and tells Rei to go, promising to keep Daisuke alive. Though, it seems like that's going to be hard. Daisuke smashes Lewis into a wall, but then he launches a smoke screen, emerging in his spider form, and boy is he big. Rei and Yuko stumble on a dead end, where Shiori corners them with her weapon drawn. She fires, but Rei doesn't feel anything, until he notices Yuko has fallen beside him. She's still breathing, but Yuko is spitting blood. Shiri tells him to step away or else he'll die too. In the middle of the tension, Yuko takes Rei by surprise. Trying to communicate with the last of her remaining strength, she asks Shiori to at least let him stay with her while she dies, and she agrees. He takes her in his arms and scream Lewis's name, which freaks Shiori. She turns around and while she's looking away, Rei throws both him and Yuko down into the forest. He gets pretty scratched up in the fall, but has to keep moving. What they don't realize is that Rei has taken exactly the route his enemies expected him to. And what's even worse is that Daisuke is back on the move, having defeated Lewis in the basement. After running some distance, Rei stops to check on Yuko. She is in a rough way, and bleeding a lot. Thinking fast, Rei takes some of his blood pouches and starts feeding them to her, mouth to mouth. And it seems to work, until Kyoko appears with a scalpel at his cheek. Uh oh, now they're in trouble. Kyoko is acting just as messed up as usual, and even dressed up in Yuko's uniform for the sake of her artistic endeavors. Kyoko tries to stab him, and he tackles her, pinning her on the ground and trying to wrestle the scalpel out of her grasp. Because she's actually a psycho, Kyoko bites a chunk of his arm off, which catches him off guard, and allows her to get the upper hand again. Rei is used to her crazy rambling by now, and uses the opportunity to hit her with his bag, sprinting over to Yuko. Before he can reach her, Shiori's other henchman Matsui appears, and slams him into the ground. Once he's prone, Kyoko stabs her scalpel through his hand and tells him all about how long she's been planning her revenge. Her ultimate aim is to destroy the love between Rei and Yuko, so she wants to take Yuko's place by eating her. And then she wants to eat him too. She just kicks Yuko in the face, stomping on her stomach while yelling about how she wants to make a stew from her tongue. Yikes. In the middle of her rampage, she gets a call from Shiori, who tells her about the bag and orders her to crush the cocoons, their only hope at bringing Yuko back to her full strength. Shiori orders her to stab the monster a few more times to finish her off. It turns out, Shiori is a monster too. Her hatred for the professor goes so deep exactly because he turned her into a spider, and she wants to destroy the rest of his creations too. She also tells Rei that Lewis is going to die soon. He had a short life expectancy anyway, but his fight with Daisuke weakened him. And just at that moment, the man of the hour shows up. Kyoko is lowering her scalpel over Yuko when a bullet flies through her hand. Look who finally came to his senses. Daisuko has her on the ground with just one punch. In a flash, it's revealed that Lewis was the real winner of the fight. 
Once he came back to consciousness, he broke out of Shiori's mind control and Lewis told him everything. Matsui is also under Shiori's control, but they let him stay under the influence so that Daisuke could keep pretending to be on their side, allowing Matsui to lead him straight to the others. But in order to do that, he had to leave Lewis, and believes him now to be dead. Having tied up Kyoko, he now faces Matsui, his old friend from the office, who is still under Shiori's control. Matsui is stronger than he seems, but the more effort he gives, the more Daisuke gives back. Soon the detective emerges victorious. Then, Rei passes out, probably from blood loss, and wakes up in Yuko's lap. While Rei was out, his uncle tried to heal her bullet wound, but she wouldn't let him touch her. Rei tries to administer some first aid himself, but then the big boss herself finally shows. Shiori gives the boys a chance to escape, warning them that if they try to get between her and Yuko, she'll kill all of them. Daisuko draws his gun, but she went ups him and draws like 15. Apparently she can use her powers to hang guns from the trees on spider webs, which I'm not totally sure about the logic there, but anyway. Kyoko suddenly wakes up and points out that if she fires from the tree, she'll probably hit her too. As expected, Shiori fires anyway, tearing half the forest apart. Rei, Daisuke, and Yuko manage to get to cover, and Kyoko was lucky enough not to get hit. But after controlling so many weapons at once, Shiori needs a little boost of energy, so she drops down next to Kyoko for a little bite to eat. Although, it looks like she has more than just a bite. By the time she's done with her, Kyoko is spent. After disposing of Kyoko, Shiori blocks off their exit with spider silk, trying to force them to come out the other side. Rei almost falls for it, but luckily his uncle is smarter. Daisuke starts fighting, but when the smoke clears, the detective is strung up. As Rei watches, she transforms back into her human form, almost totally naked and covered in webs. Ew. Daisuke rightfully calls her a pervert, before she whips herself up a set of clothes and aims his gun right at him. Rei begs her to stop, and again asks why she's going so far to destroy the monster in Yuko. Realizing he still doesn't know how her and Lewis were turned into monsters, Shiori decides to clear up the gaps in Rei's knowledge. The man who started this whole thing is Professor Kusunoki. Shiori was working part-time as his assistant. She met Lewis as one of the young volunteers, who were all very friendly and bonded quickly. Little did they know they were going to be turned into monsters. Lewis and Shiori were the only survivors, and since she doesn't want any more bodies to be infested, she's sworn to eradicate every one of the remaining test subjects, including herself. Damn. That's dark. After hearing her story, Rei only asks that she spare his uncle's life. Shiori just tells him to get out of the way so she can kill that useless monster. Rei finally finds the backbone to get up and defend them just as Lewis turns up, rising from the dead like a phoenix from the ashes. Though, I feel like we all knew he wasn't really dead, right? He managed to save himself using the cocoons from the basement, and has regained enough of his power to put up a real fight. Shiori turns into her true form as Lewis admits he really is close to the end of his life now. He promises to give them enough time to go to the basement and find the truth about the monsters, though he also gives them the option to run away and save themselves. But Rei needs to know the truth. He needs to get to that basement, hoping that something down there will help him save Lewis. He takes off with Yuko by his side. When they reach the basement, there's a whole new set of stairs waiting for them, but Yuko is more interesting in the test subject room. She curls up on the bloodstained bed while Rei leaves her to go explore the subterranean levels. After discovering some horrific corpses, he finds a room full of books, including the research files, a letter from Lewis, a bottle of olive oil, and a knife. It's like a game of Clue. In the research files, he discovers that his own life is nearly at an end. You see, the way these spiders breed is by taking the form of their first prey, then capturing a member of the opposite sex for their breeding partner and final prey. By feeding on him for so long, Yuko has been transforming Rei into a monster, little by little. But it's anyone's guess as to whether she will decide to finally make him her meal. Disturbed, Rei throws the book to the floor, just as he hears Yuko's footsteps approaching. With a vial of olive oil coating the knife by his side, he greets his monster girlfriend for the first time exactly as she is, a predator. He rushes at her with the knife, and says he has no choice but to kill her. But he freezes when he hears her speak for the first time, as both the monster and Yuko. They tell him they want him, and want to love him. After a moment to decide, Rei raises the knife. Yuko closes her eyes, as if preparing for the end, but Rei can't do it. He tosses the knife and she smiles, pulling him close enough to, <clears throat> cop a feel. Well, that's one way to cut the tension. He pulls her in and ends up kissing her, just in time for her to spurt furry legs from her back. Rei tries to act like that's not a giant turnoff, and as thanks, she licks him. She starts crawling all over him, and suddenly sucks his eye right out of the socket. As Rei watches, she swallows it and begins to devour him. And even though it hurts more than he could have imagined, it also feels really, really good. So good that he doesn't resist as she rips him apart. 
Things get even weirder when one of his hands flies off, replaced with a spider pincer. He accidentally slices Yuka with it and then apologizes, as if she's not literally tearing him to pieces in return. Ray realizes that he's hungry, and she tells him not to hold back. So he digs in, feasting on her blood and, uh, getting a little raunchy while he's at it. But in like a really gross, gory, spider monster way. In the letter left by Lewis, it's revealed that he is actually the father of Yuko's monster. During the experiment, he fell in love with another of the participants, and together they had a child. Although his partner died in the lab, Lewis never stopped looking for his daughter. When he eventually found Rei, he found her too, and never admitted that he knew what path Rei was on, what Yuko would eventually do to him. Which is all well and good, but all I can think is how the heck did he feel watching them make out? It was also Lewis who left him the knife. At the end, he gave him a choice, to either become a monster or save himself and his humanity. As he's reading this, already half transformed, Rei is still determined to save him, so he straps up his injuries and grabs Yuko, heading for the door. Above ground, Lewis and Shiori have had such a violent fight that they've torn up half the forest. They're back in their human forms now, and Shiori has let the lid off their emotions. It turns out she has more reason to hate the professor than anyone, even Lewis. During the experiments, he locked her in a room and allowed one of the test subjects to corner her and devour her human body. Even after all she's suffered, Lewis and Shiori have a bond, and they don't want to hurt each other. So, instead of killing him, Shiori decides to stay with Lewis, at least until his death. But who returns to ruin their lovely moment? Kyoko, of course, who is apparently still alive. She doesn't waste any time, slashing Shiori in the chest and laughing maniacally into the sky. In the end, she was the only real monster. Before she can deliver the final blow, they're interrupted by the arrival of another spider. It seems Kasuke, the evil test subject who took advantage of Shiori, is still alive, and determined to do the same again. Well, clearly he's a horrible person, but at least he took care of Kyoko. She's not coming back after that. Shiori begs Lewis to kill her. Since the two of them are bonded, if she dies, then Kasuke won't be far behind. The monstrous Kasuke stops that from happening when he strings up Lewis in a tree, emerging from his spider form to slash him over and over and over again. Lewis almost lands a hit on Shiori before Kasuke runs him through. He's about to cut him into little pieces when someone cuts his captive free. It's Rei, walking in like a total boss, half human and half monster, warning Kasuke not to touch his father-in-law. Rei passes Lewis a blood pouch to help him recover, while Yugo restrains Kasuke with her webs. But because of his loyalty to Lewis, Rei sort of just jumped in without having a clue what's going on. Lewis briefly explains about Kasuke, and Shiori admits she's no longer a threat. Now, they're united by a common enemy, Kasuke. Lewis wants to settle this himself, with his special spider venom ability. He's going to give Kasuke a lethal dose, but then Kasuke hears another voice inside his head. At the same time, a familiar hand reaches out from one of the spider's legs and stabs Lewis. The hand gets to work cutting through the silk strings, as a familiar voice calls out. Kyoko's face emerges from Kasuke's back, because apparently being resurrected three times in one series is totally plausible. The monster, consisting of Kyoko and Kasuke, swipes Lewis and sends him flying through the trees. Before they know what's happening, Yuko is strung up between two trees, almost torn to pieces. Kyoko and Kasuke are now in a weird, hybrid human form, holding Shiori on one side and threatening Yuko on the other. And just when they least expect it, Rei comes flying towards them, slicing off Kasuke's hand and forcing him to drop Shiori. Suddenly, able to use his spider abilities, Rei does his best to tackle the beast before him, even though that means essentially fighting two enemies at once, and with his eyes closed. What actually happened is that Lewis was able to communicate with him while the two of them were injured, and asked to borrow his body so that he could fight on his behalf. So, the person inside Rei's body right now is Lewis, who is so fast Kasuke doesn't even see it coming when he slices his head clean off. Apparently, that doesn't quite satisfy him, because next, Lewis slices him into pieces. Kasuke's head rolls towards Shiori, who is only too happy to bash it in until he's little more than a stain on the ground. Meanwhile, the stump that is Kyoko is crawling away. She arrives at Yuko, still hanging from the webs, and decides she'll try to eat her. Seriously, this girl is obsessed with cannibalism. But Yuko knows better than to let Kyoko get too close. Summoning an army of spiders, they repeat the same scene from all those chapters ago and crawl all over Kyoko, eating her alive. Rei watches, horrified as she crawls towards him asking for help. He leaves her to cut Yuko down, which infuriates Kyoko just enough to attempt one last murder. Before she can try, Rei has her speared through. She curses him with her dying breath and asks him to promise that he'll never forget her. Somehow, I don't think that's likely, given she's tried to kill him like six or seven times. Now, Lewis is really on his last legs. The others gather around, and as Lewis tries to say goodbye, Rei yells at him to wait. He still has so many questions to ask, so much to learn. Lewis apologizes, but then Yuko sits in front of him. All she has to do is call him father once, and he starts to cry. The two of them embrace, and just like that, he passes away. 
Two months later, Daisuke is back at the detective office. Ray hasn't been seen since that day when Daisuke returned. All he found was a puddle of blood and a lot of spiderwebs. Missing his nephew, he goes to Ray's apartment, where he finds Ray and Yuko. Ray only came to say goodbye, but Daisuke has a lot of questions. First, about the eye that has grown back as a spider eye, which is kinda cool. He tells his uncle that there's no Ray in his body anymore. Before he leaves, Daisuke tells him not to forget his name, and that he should come back to eat hot pot whenever he wants, promising to always be there for him. Which is really sweet. Even if his nephew is a monster, he'll always be his uncle. Rei and Yuko return to their lodge, where Shiori is waiting for them. Louis's last request was for her to act as their guardian, and ever since then, she's taught Rei everything about being a monster. They dine on blood pouches together that evening, when Yuko abruptly asks Rei if they can have a baby together. A little flustered, he makes a load of excuses before escaping. Ray seems to struggle with the concept of love and babies, as any young guy would. Shiori has to practically beat it into his head that he and Yuku are way past the stage of being shy about love. Literally. She tells him to stick his tongue out and then punches his jaw. Ray is just scared of being a parent. He still is college age, after all. Shiori tells him to follow his heart, and decides to leave the cabin for a few days, giving Ray a chance to wander out and bring his girlfriend home. They have a heart-to-heart, -heart and Ray kisses her, admitting that he wants to spend his life with her before they… well, you can guess what happens next. I guess in this case, it really would be true to say they lived happily ever after. I hope you enjoyed Name no Nai Kaibutsu. If you liked this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more recap content.